I invite you now to listen for God's word as it comes to us from the hand of the Apostle Paul as he writes to the church in Rome, the book of Romans, the third chapter beginning to read at the 21st verse. Listen for God's holy word. But now God's righteousness has been revealed apart from the law, which is confirmed by the law and the prophets. God's righteousness comes through the faithfulness of Jesus Christ. For all who have faith in him, there is no distinction. All have sinned and fall short of God's glory, but all are treated as righteous freely by the grace because of ransom that was paid by Christ Jesus. Through his faithfulness, God displayed Jesus as the place of sacrifice, where mercy is found by means of his blood. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness in passing over our sins that happened before during the time of God's patient tolerance. He also did this to demonstrate that he is righteous in the present time and treat the one who has faith in Jesus as righteous. What happens to our bragging? It is thrown out. Which, with which the law? With what we have accomplished under the law? No, not at all. But through the law of faith, we consider that a person is treated as righteous by faith, apart from what is accomplished under the law. God's holy word. I have practiced ministry for now a little over 35 years, and approximately the 10th year of my ministry, I was a pastor in Irving, Texas. And in that 10th year of ministry, I invited one of my favorite professors from Columbia Theological Seminary where I accomplished my master's degree, to come and stand in the pulpit as a guest in the church that I served. Grace and I both studied with this professor, and I was thrilled that she accepted my invitation to come to Irving, Texas from Atlanta, Georgia, and to preach on this particular morning. And the service was marvelous. She preached, naturally, a very powerful sermon, and I was the worship leader on the other side of the chancel area that morning, not only was I the worship leader, but I also had the opportunity to officiate for the baptism of a small infant. And following the worship service, this professor and I both went to the lobby of the church where we greeted people as they exited the sanctuary, much as we do here in this place. And I was able to eavesdrop and hear many of the members shaking her hand and bragging about my ministry and how much they appreciated my ministry. And of course, I appreciated every word that I could hear being said. But do you know what was most important to me? I was looking forward to the last person in worship leaving the sanctuary so this person held in high esteem would come forward and say, thank you, Doug. Thank you for the honor that is, you've invited me to stand here in this church that you serve and to preach. And I want to say to you how proud I am of what you've accomplished in ministry since you last room. That is not what happened. After the last person had exited the sanctuary, this professor urgently walked over to me, and in a scolding voice, she said, you did not ask the parents if they renounced sin. And then she repeated herself, you did not ask the parents of the child if they renounced sin in their life. Her anger was such that I thought perhaps she was going to march over to my office and remove my master's degree from the wall. And then she continued, you were taught better than that. I taught you better than that. In the 25 years of ministry since that morning, I have not invited her to preach again. <laughs> but what makes that memory so difficult for me is that she was absolutely right. Your associate pastor, Greg Rapier, and I were taught better than that. We were taught as a part of our master's program that in the Reformed theological tradition of which we stand as Presbyterians, we acknowledge that the road to wholeness 
always begins with an acknowledgement that we are a broken people, that we have failed God and we have failed one another, and we must confess that before we receive the waters of baptism. Baptism is the acknowledgement that we have been going the wrong way in life and that we are tired of living that way and we wish to go the other way. To renounce sin is simply to say, I no longer want to live that way again. It's not that I forgot to ask that question. It goes on. I'm going to ask that the sound come from this here. I'm having difficulty with my hear. Let's make the sound come from here. I didn't forget. I chose not to ask that question. For the 10 years prior, I never asked that question. And for the 25 years since, I have not asked the question at baptism, do you renounce sin? I've covered my theological bases, of course. I do not want to be removed from ministry for negligence. It's just that those words, do you renounce sin, are hard words. They have a hard edge to them when you're standing up baptizing someone, particularly a beautiful ceremony of an infant. So I'll cover my bases by asking this question. Do you love the Lord Jesus Christ? And do you promise to follow him as Lord and as your Savior? Now that is subtle, but it is hard as a diamond. If you say that you will accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, that means that you know that you need to be saved from something. It means simply that you have been going the wrong way and that your relationship with Jesus Christ is a broken relationship and that you wish to live differently now. So I've covered my theological basis. I just can't simply ask the question, do you renounce sin? Can you imagine that question being asked when you're standing before a congregation with a beautiful baby in your arms and someone asks you to renounce sin? I've just not been able to do that. But that's what baptism is all about. Baptism is acknowledging that we have gone in the wrong direction. And it is saying that I am tired of going in this direction. And that I wish to go in a different direction. An alcoholic can begin the road to recovery until they first acknowledge their needfulness. An addict cannot begin the road to recovery until that addict has first acknowledged that they are going the wrong way. And someone in a broken relationship with God cannot start going and say, I have wronged God and I have wronged others and I no longer want to live this way and intend or of the risen Christ to go in a different direction. Baptism is the beginning of us turning around and going in a different way in life. Some 22 years ago, I was called to be the pastor of the Lenape Valley Presbyterian Church in New Britain, Pennsylvania. And when I arrived in that congregation, at that time, that church hosted a weekly AA meeting, Alcoholics Anonymous. And as the new pastor of that congregation, that group wanted me to come and introduce myself, and they wanted to introduce themselves to me. I was honored to accept that invitation. And that evening when I was at the AA meeting, about two dozen participants were there, and everyone, everyone, very sincerely, walked up and introduced themselves to me. Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Susan, and I'm an alcoholic. Hi, I'm Debbie, and Pastor... I'm an alcoholic. Everyone gave me their name and then said, I'm an alcoholic. 
everyone acknowledged their brokenness. Honestly acknowledged that they have been going in the wrong direction. I was asked to speak, but before I spoke, the leaders of that group came and spoke to me and said, Doug, you just experienced nearly two dozen people acknowledging their brokenness. And if all we do here in this meeting is acknowledge that we are a broken people, if all we do in this place is say, Hi, my name is Doug, I am an alcoholic, there is no good news in that. There is no hope in that. And at that moment, I heard something so profound, I will never forget it. There is simply no good news in acknowledging that we are a broken people and have been going the wrong direction. And that is precisely what the Apostle Paul is doing here in his letter to the church in Rome. He mentions first the law of God. The law you're most familiar with is the law of the Ten Commandments, but if you were to look at every law in the, of the Old Testament, there's 613 of them. And the reason the Apostle Paul lifts up the law of God is so that we can look at the law and see just how we have fallen short of what God expects us to be in relationship to God and relationship with other people. The law is important because it shows us how great of a need we have. But just like the leaders of AA, to know that we have fallen short is not good news. Not at all. So the leaders of AA shares with me that we come here not only to acknowledge our brokenness, we come and receive a plan. You may know it as the 12-step plan, but it's a plan where we can move from brokenness to wholeness. The Apostle Paul does the same thing in the verses I to you just a moment ago. The law so, we've been going in the wrong direction. But Paul writes, God has a plan for us. If we would acknowledge our brokenness before God and cleave to the person of Jesus Christ and say that he is our Lord and our Savior, God will come alongside us and walk away our that's even more powerful than forgive your sins. God says that I declare in the sacrament of baptism, I will wash your sins from you and you will be righteous. Righteous means as if you are perfect. As if you are perfect and always have been. The law tells us that we are a needful people. And that's not good news. The good news is that God has given to us a plan where we can move from brokenness to wholeness. And that is by cleaving to the person of Jesus Christ. The Alcoholics Anonymous leaders shared one more thing with me. Yes, Doug, it is important for us to come and to confess our brokenness Hi, I'm Dave, and I'm an alcoholic. And we can offer them the good news that here's a plan. And you work this plan, and you will begin the road. But if the people here tonight walk out of here and say, Yes, I'm an alcoholic, and I've been given this marvelous plan, and do nothing with it, they remain in brokenness. They remain an alcoholic. It is only by working the plan that we move toward recovery. By working the plan, we move toward wholeness. They also shared with me that understand, Doug, no one follows the plan perfectly. 
All of us stumble. All of us fail. All of it, as some people would say, fall off the wagon. But as a group, we hold one another accountable, and we come alongside and we help one another to start the plan again. Baptism is the declaration that God gives to us that we are washed of our sins so that we can be whole before God. But don't make a mistake. Just like those who are working the 12 steps in Alcoholics Anonymous, baptism doesn't mean that we will never sin again. Oh, I wish that were true. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and we will still stumble and we will still fall down and we will still cause brokenness between us and God and one another. So what does baptism mean? It means that we are no longer satisfied with that way of life and that we are going to strive to move forward. Baptism means that we are no longer alone in this world. Baptism means that now God comes alongside us and helps us. When we do fall, God is there to pick us back up and to embrace us and to encourage us as we move forward. And the way we strive, the way we move from broken is by paying attention to Jesus. Just as those who are struggling with alcoholism cannot move if they ignored the plan. We must pay attention to God's plan, and that plan is to pay attention to Jesus. And that is simply done by reading the scriptures regularly and getting to know who Jesus Christ is. Do you know Jesus Christ as well as you know your spouse or your best friend? Read the scriptures. Read them regularly so that you can learn who Christ is and what Christ's values are and what Christ stood for and what passions that Christ had. And then strive to obey what you understand. I've said it before that there are people who come to me and they are discouraged because they say, Pastor, I read the Bible and I don't understand all of it. That is okay. You will understand some of it. Start there. Simply obey what you do understand. When the scriptures tell us, do not steal, do you need an explanation? Just don't steal anymore. Get to know Jesus Christ and then obey as best as you are able. Understanding that the pastor is saying this morning, you will fail. But that is okay because in your failing, God shows up and God encourages you. And what God does in our baptism is God takes our strivings, as weak or as strong as they may be, and works a transformation in us. God, slowly by God's power, changes us so that we become more and more like Jesus Christ. The law of God makes it clear that we are not right with God. Jesus Christ is the plan to move toward being right with God. But we must work the plan. We work the plan by paying attention to this book and by obeying as best as we can, trusting our stumbles to Almighty God. Let me close by reminding of a story I've used before. Of a story of a monastery on a hilltop. And from time to time, the monks of that monastery would come down from the mountain and move about the town below. And some young boys one day asked the monks, what is it that you do up there all day long in the monastery? And the answer was simple. 
we fall down. We skin our knees. We get back up. And we strive forward. Until the next time that we fall down and skin our knees and have to get back up all over again. And then the monks smirked and said to the boys, we call ourselves the society, the society of skinned knees. We all belong to the society of skinned knees. But in our baptism, we have said we no longer want to live that way. And when we do fall down and skin our knees, God is there to pick us up and to help us as we strive once again to move in a different direction. My professor 25 years ago was absolutely right. I didn't ask, do you renounce sin? But it is a good question. At this very moment, I'm asking you to answer in your head and in your heart. Do you personally renounce sin? Meaning, are you willing to say, this way of living is no longer working for me, and I want to go in another direction? If you say yes, you don't need waters at the baptismal font now. You have the presence of the risen Christ coming alongside of you and embracing you and saying, welcome. We are going to go home together. Amen.